my name is Ifemena Iluizio Baudu. Ife for short, I am the interim coordinator of the Justice Reform Project. And again, I am your compare for today. My job is very simple to move you from point A to point B to Z of the program. Um, before I call out the first speaker, I'd just like to do a recap of what we uh, went through yesterday. Essentially, discussions yesterday centered around how the bar at the bench, the bench in particular, can function better, how we can, as a profession, you know, service the public a lot better. So we discussed two um, models very briefly. We discussed the introduction of the model law and more in more detail, the adoption of a digital court system, specifically the remote hearing. Um, yesterday, we showed um, a demonstration, a mock hearing, which was organized by the Justice Reform Project in collaboration with the Labour State Judiciary. And we had a few questions and answered a few debates, and it was a very enlightening session. Today, we're going to now focus more on how the justice system affects the public. Um, at JRP, one of our key philosophies is that the justice system is not for us, it is not for the lawyers, it is not for the judges, it is indeed for the public. And the public confidence is something that is very crucial to, and is a measure of how well we are functioning as the bar and bench. So without further ado, I will call on Mr. Soji Apampa. Mr. Soji Apampa is the head of Integrity Organization, Limited by Guarantee. Mr. Apampa is also a big part of JRP. He's my boss at the Secretariat. So Mr. Apampa, welcome. And we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Ifemina. And it's a pleasure to be here on this uh, JRP panel and this roadshow. And I want to, on behalf of JRP, as has been said already yesterday, thank the Edo State Government once again for, um, for hosting this. But for the ordinary citizen, the feeling is that the administration of justice system in Nigeria does not work for the poor. It doesn't work for citizens. It is really not for ordinary people in Nigeria. That is the uh, predominant feeling. And why is there this strong feeling? This strong feeling has come because people believe that it is for private and special interests. Private interests who are able to pay, private interests who have priority access so they seem to have priority access with the police, priority access with the justice system and with judges, even though I'm sure that many of those who are on the call who are from the bar or the bench will, will argue with me, but I'm speaking uh, based on the predominant feeling that except you are powerful, the police will not answer you when you have an issue. The judges, um, again, will, will, will um, tend to answer more um, what the powerful, already powerful in society are saying and asking for, again, maybe because of their access and because they are able to get the right representation as opposed to other members of society. The same thing with the bailiffs, because like the police, if you do not pay to get certain things done, they just will not be done. So even to get the public uh, prosecutor to act in certain cases, it depends on who you are. So there's this strong feeling that justice is not for the ordinary citizen. Then, um, but people feel that an equitable society will ensure that it works fairly for all citizens, even for those without voice. So we welcome what we see in Lagos State where we, there's an office of the public defender, where there, there are things that for those who don't have voice, those who don't have the power, those who don't have the money, that there is an alternative system for them to access justice. Um, this is a strong factor. So besides money, is the issue of time. The time it takes to actually get justice is still an issue. And I know that that works for all citizens. 
um, it is very, very difficult to secure a judgment in Nigeria. And even when you get the judgment, it's difficult to get it enforced in Nigeria at the moment. So you can imagine the level of powerlessness and helplessness that ordinary citizens feel when it comes to the issue of the administration of justice. So many of us have been schooled in, in, in the theory that it is our rights, it is an aggregation of our rights that we have ceded to government for government to express on our behalf that the whole mandate of government comes from our rights that we have ceded in order to have an orderly society. But when we start to feel that that society uh, is not orderly, and secondly, that it will never work in our favor, then a level of despair starts to come in. And if the events of the last month are anything to go by, the level of despair, the level of desperation, the level of anger toward the state is building up day by day, year by year in Nigeria. And it's beginning to affect the foundations of society and to question whether or not we can have um, the rule of law and whether we can have law and order in Nigerian society. So it is all mixed up in the administration of justice system, which if it doesn't work for the ordinary person, for, for the tout on the street, the same way as it can work for Mr. Dangote, for instance, then this ill feeling towards the administration of justice system will continue and the resort to self-help and self-help systems, self-help to get redress will continue to grow. Um, and if that happens, um, as I said earlier, the foundations of our society will be called to question. So when we allow corruption to be added into the mix, where it's not just because of structural problems, but because people are able to corrupt the system that they get away with it, then that makes it even more uh, intolerable. Uh, and finally, I would say that if, if we cannot guarantee rule of law, if we cannot guarantee equity and fairness, and if we cannot make Nigeria appear to be a reasonable jurisdiction where people feel that certain laws can only be uh, enforced um, if they are in front of foreign courts, not in front of Nigerian courts, then we will have a problem having faith in our country. This is part of why the justice reform project has become very important. If you look at countries where the levels of corruption are very low, you will see it correlates also to uh, jurisdictions that have strong rule of law as well. And you will find that also um, development um, and human development index is much better than in areas where the uh, administration of justice is challenged or, or where we're unable to, um, to ensure justice for all. So it is really important that reform comes to that area. So we welcome the actions of the Justice Reform Project to ensure that the justice system in Nigeria works much better for the ordinary citizen for, for the poor and for everyone else who are not themselves lawyers or themselves uh, members of the bench. And the whole idea is for us to be able to move towards a good society where we all feel a part of it before our society disintegrates. So we feel that there's an existential threat for Nigeria if the administration of justice system is not fixed and urgently too. So I would like to implore everyone on this call to consider signing up to the Justice Reform Project and joining hands with it. Yes, it's got lawyers, it's got members of, of, the, of the bench, but it's also got ordinary citizens signing up, civil society, businesses, 
everyone is encouraged to join this because if we don't fix it, we won't be able to do anything else to fix our country and our economy. Thank you very much. Over to you, Efemina. Thank you so much, Mr. Pampa. So without wasting too much time, um, I will call on our partners. That's Professor Abdullahi Shehu of the UNODC, United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime. They've done tremendous work in the justice sector. He's going to speak on corruption in the judiciary. He's going to give us an introduction and then take us through the facts. Thank you very much. I will now share Professor Shehu's slide. Um, and then we can... Well, uh, thank you very much. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Soji, for setting the uh, stage for discussion. If I were to continue from where you stop, I would be pessimistic. Pessimistic in the sense that um, when we were transiting from the military to democratic uh, governance in Nigeria in 1999, I was so optimistic that it was an opportunity for us uh, to reject the justice system and improve uh, the speed of justice in Nigeria. So several proposals were made. Uh, they needed this in the justice sector. They needed that in the justice sector. At the end, I realized that even those who were active in making the proposals, when they became chief judges, even in their states, they couldn't change many things. At the federal level, very little could change. I don't know where the problem is, but I still insist and uh, follow the path that uh, Soji has taken, that something must be done. Otherwise, we shall grandstand or we shall be dancing in cycle. Well, this is just a follow up to what Soji has said. Um, I was asked to present some facts, evidence from uh, two uh, corruption survey that Nigeria uh, conducted through the uh, Nash, is it uh, Nigerian Bureau for Statistics, National Bureau for Statistics, MBS, with the support and collaboration of the UNODC. The first report was conducted in 2016, and the second was conducted in 2019. Um, the, the report is quite long, uh, and it dissects the level of cor corruption in all sectors, not only in the judiciary, in most of the public sector, particularly those public sectors that come into contact with majority of Nigerians on a daily basis. So I was asked to focus on the evidence <clears throat> regarding or emerging uh, from Edo State. So my focus is to give you some facts about what we found uh, coming out from uh, Edo State. But before doing that, let me just give a preliminary background about the study. That unlike most uh, studies on corruption, this study was not a perception study. It was an experience study, whereby the people who were interviewed were asked to state their real-time experience with respect to corruption. Secondly, it is not the survey of grand corruption. It is survey on a specific type of corruption that we say is called bribery, which is a form of corruption, of course, and which people, some people feel that the grand corruption is more impactful than this, but that is a relative uh, perception. Uh, therefore, um, the, the figures actually uh, talk about bribery in the, the various sectors that were surveyed, the, the experience of people who came in contact uh, with the various officials uh, in, in, in that report. Uh, the additional aspect of it in 2019 was uh, the other forms of corruption that were surveyed. Uh, in other words, uh, nepotism uh, and vote buying. And uh, their results are also quite uh, revealing. 
So against this background, I will not present the entire findings of the reports, uh, for, of the two reports, but I'll focus on the second survey report and also focus on the findings emerging from uh, the regional uh, outcome from the South-South and within South-South, I'm focusing on Edo State. And if you want me to draw attention to the justice sector, I will also do that. Thank you very much. Next slide, please. The results, move on. I'm going to talk about the results. Now, Edo State is one of the states in the South-South region of Nigeria with a population of about 4.4 million, uh, about 39% of the population are urban and 60% rural. Now, with respect to the level of contact that people had, according to this report, uh, for Nigeria, the overall contact um, in 2016 was 52.2. In 2019, it was 63, which means the level of contact overall in Nigeria increased. In Edo State, uh, in 2016, it was 79.2, but in 2019, it came down to 65.3. I don't have any evidence to explain this. It could be obviously because uh, people seeking services were not seeking the services that they sought for in 2016. Now, with respect to prevalence, the overall result in Nigeria shows that there was a slight decline of the uh, experience of corruption from 32.3 in 2016 to 30.2 in 2019. For Edo State, um, there is a slight increase rather. Uh, it was 37.6 in 2016, but in, in, in 2019, it was 38.1, meaning that people experience more corruption uh, and again, it's difficult to analyze the data with a lower level of contact and higher level of uh, uh, corruption experience. At the same time, we say it's not a perception. So this leaves us with a footfall. Next slide, please. <clears throat> uh, with respect to prevalence rate by type of public official, um, the report in 2016 shows that public utility officials in Edo State was about 34.4, and uh, in 2019 was 35.8, which means there was a relative increase in terms of bribery uh, uh, among public utility officers. Public utilities defined here, maybe people providing either electricity, uh, water, and other util domestic utilities. Uh, within the police, um, there was a significant decline though, because in 2016, it was at 3.9, but in 2019, it, um, uh, sorry, yes, in 2016, there was, there was no decline, sorry, an increase again. In 2016 was 33% and 2019 was 38%. With respect to the frequency, the overall for Nigeria was 5.8 in 2016 and 6.0 in 2019. For Edo State, the frequency, the frequency increased slightly uh, from 3.6 in 2016 to 4.6 in 2019. Again, a uh, sort of conundrum, uh, lower level of contact and higher level of frequency. So it means more people were demanding or more people were given bribe in 2019 compared to 2016. Coming down the, the lower slides, percentage distribution of total number of bribes, bribes paid in 2019. Uh, the highest, was with the public utilities, as I earlier indicated, uh, followed by uh, police officers, and then followed by, uh, I think, doctors, nurses, midwives, and others, as you can see. You can raise the slide a little bit so that uh, participants can see very well. 
from the screen. We rest, oh, okay, it's <laughs> too, it's a bit, okay, that's fine. With respect to the average of cash, of amount of cash bribes in Naira, uh, for Nigeria, it was 7.7 .7 in 2016. It was 5.7 in uh, 2019. So we can say a slight decline. For Edo State also, uh, for Edo State, it was 3.5 in 2016, but that rose to 4.2 in 2019 consistent with the rise in the frequency of bribe, again, uh, frequency level inconsistent with the level of contacts. Next slide, please. Prevalence rate by sex of bribe pair. Um, the, one of the questions that preoccupy discussions on this report often is, are men and women affected differently uh, uh, by corruption, or are men more corrupt than women? Um, in 2016, the rate by sex for male was 40%, and also the same thing also, uh, sorry, in 2019, it was also 40%. In 2019 for Edo State, a slight increase of about 1% from 35% to 36%. Could be also because of the increase in frequency. With respect to pre uh, prevalence uh, rate by urban and rural, um, for, the, um, for Nigeria as a whole in 2006, 16, it was 26.9 and in 2019 was 44.0. So slight increase. This is a significant increase, not a slight in, uh, increase. However, in Edo State, there was a significant decline. Um, the level for 2016 was 42.8, and in 2019 was 33.4. So the Edo State uh, statistics generally is interesting. You can see certain things emerging like uh, a sort of conundrum. Uh, for what Nigerians considered the most important issue that was for the country as a whole, um, in 2016, uh, people that felt that corruption, uh, sorry, unemployment was the major uh, problem, they were just about 14%. And in 2019, it rose to 23%. Meaning that in 2019, people considered unemployment the most important problem for them compared to infrastructure and even uh, level of corruption. Because in 2016, 17.7% uh, felt that the most important problem was corruption, but in 2016, only 146 felt that corruption was a problem. So they shifted ground to, uh, in terms of experience of the problem. So you can see the chart by the right, uh, also explaining uh, the percentage overall. Next, please. Acceptability among Nigerians of law enforcement officers requesting for bribes. That is uh, the willingness to pay bribes. In 2016, 69% said they never or they will not pay bribes. 63% said uh, they will or they paid bribe. In, sorry, let me get this correct. Uh, in, yes, uh, that is for the ages between 18 and 24. For 35 to 49 years old range, 73% in 2016 resisted paying bribe, 61% resisted paying bribe in 2016, uh, sorry, in 2019. For 50 to 64 years, in 2016, 73% resisted paying bribe, 
but that declined in 2019 to only 58% for those who declined. Now, awareness and effectiveness of anti-corruption, uh, because if you have a problem of corruption, you are expected to report. But are people aware of the places where they are supposed to report? In 2016, 40% said, yes, they are aware of the police and they could report to police. And 25% said they knew the police, they could report to the police. 73% uh, said they will report to EFCC, meaning that they had more confidence in the EFCC than the police. And 63% said so also in 66% said so in 2019. So some 54% uh, said they were going to report to the Federal High Court. And in 2019, 53% said they will report to the uh, High Court. 37% uh, said they will report to ICPC. And 25% in 2019 said they will report to ICPC. Uh, you can see the, the, the rate for high, FCT High Court, which was distinct because some people could not differentiate between the High Court and the Federal High Court. So some, some referred to the Federal High Court, especially those interviewed in Abuja, and 30% in 2016 said they will report to the FCT High Court, and 15% only referred to the FCT High Court in 2016. 19, respectively. Next. Uh, other forms of corruption, vote buying. Uh, for Nigeria, for vote buying was only an indicator in 2019. So there is no comparator data for 2016. And in 2019, 21.1% said they, 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 they either sold their vote or they were approached to sell their vote. That is for the Federation. About 23.9% in Edo State said this happened. Whether this is true with the last election or not, um, it is something we can ponder on. Now, with respect to the uh, perception in government's commitment and effectiveness, even though this survey was not a perception survey, um, about 58% for Nigeria and uh, said government was committed. No, 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 no. In 2000, and I can analyze this data, what this uh, is actually saying. Um, Okay, for, 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 for Nigeria as a whole, I think it was 58%, and for Edo State, it was 51%. With respect to the effectiveness of anti-corruption measures in Nigeria, it was 39%, uh, no, is it 2000, no? Yes, okay, this is 2016 data, and then it went down to 31% in 2000. Perception and government's commitment and effectiveness continues. Uh, down here in 2016, 2016 for Nigeria, it was 53%. Uh, in 2019, it was 39%. So people felt that the commitment is declining. Uh, for effectiveness, it was 40, uh, for a dose state, it was 46. I think it's a dose state. Can you, can you raise the, okay, for effectiveness, sorry, not a dose state. For effectiveness, it was 46% in 2016 and 31% in 2019. Meaning that um, the perception of commitment and effectiveness of the anti-corruption uh, effort of government has declined. Uh, in between 2016 and 2019, respectively. Next slide, please. Oh, no. 
there was a slide which I missed. Can we go back a little bit? Because there was supposed to be a slide showing the prevalence of um, corruption uh, in the judiciary. Go back small, let me see. Or oh, I missed that slide, some, that slide somewhere. Ah, uh, uh, no. Okay, I beg your pardon. I think that slide was not meant for, for a doorstep per se. It was a bit controversial. So it was only giving the slide for the Federation. So I decided uh, maybe to take it off. Uh, so far, this is what the report revealed uh, from the 2016 and 2019. The point I would like to make is that there was no specific focus on the judiciary in Edo State. Of course, the rating of corruption for the overall judiciary uh, in 2016, it was next to corruption in the police. Uh, in 2019, it declined a little bit, but this is not something for discussion since the essence of our discussion here uh, is for Edo State, and I did not want to confuse you by bringing a national uh, by bringing national data uh, to analyze for one particular state. I hope that this will give some insights into what we have seen with respect to the prevalence of corruption and the effectiveness of the anti-corruption effort by the government. I thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Shi. It was very, very interesting to listen to all the statistics. I think one thing is clear, that there is corruption, and it is very bad. Um, I also think that regardless of how we put it, the fact that there is so much corruption, it is judiciary's responsibility to ensure that the public is aware that where a bribe, where there is a bribe, where there is a crime, where there is any form of infraction, they can seek remedies with the judiciary. And to, some, to a very large extent, it is our duty as the bar and as the bench to ensure that even within our judiciary, we clean up the stables and ensure that there's no corruption or as little corruption as possible on the inside so we can clear out the outside. So very quickly, we're going to come back to take practitioner views on the state of the justice system and corruption. But before we get to that, I'd like to invite Honorable Justice Kashim Zana, the Honorable Chief Judge of Bono State, to just look into um, the justice system generally, its fitness for purpose, and particularly the work he's been doing on digitalizing the court's process and on the adoption of remote hearing. Your Lordship, thank you for joining us. Over to you. Thank you very much. May I share my screen? Allow me to share my screen first. Okay. Yes, you can now, Your Lordship. Okay, thank you very much. And I must apologize for those who may have been present yesterday. There was a mix up and I thought it was today. Actually, initially I thought it was Saturday until I remembered Friday and it, it was wrong too. So I guess I have 15 minutes. Uh, to present what I have. I saw, the, I saw my topic actually today a few, uh, about an hour ago, but uh, fortunately, the fact that it's justice reform project. Is the technology working? Is my screen visible to you? Yes, it is, Your Lordship. Yes, okay. it is. And I come clear, good. So, but it fits in uh, very well. Actually, the initial topic I was given was uh, to talk on remote hearings. I've talked so much on that that I thought uh, I'll, I'll be sounding like a broken record. But still, I'm going to talk on that within the 15 minutes if I can. Uh, now, basically, what I'm trying to present is the reform effort as it concerns court automation and uh, the work we've been doing. The committee I had, the Judicial Information Technology Policy Committee, was set up by the NJC, precisely Justice Mustafa of blessed memory. And uh, we've been working on it and have been probably too ambitious with the hindsight. 
nevertheless, we have arrived at the stage where I can say we are now making the first boarding call. And uh, basically, it's to have an integrated court automation solution for the judiciary and ultimately for the justice sector. And in that effort, uh, uh, I'm not sure I can get my slides to move. OK, good. So in that effort, We've designed a few, we have uh, come up with a few massive actually uh, software and rolled out and are now rolling out. Now, what is what are they? One is a custom communication solution, legal mail, and it's designed to address some observed lapses that have occasioned. Actually, they even touch on corruption a lot because of the lack of transparency in the communication system. They leave start coming back with proofs of service that happen to be just bogus and all sorts of things that you're familiar. Then again, as a service-oriented institution, increasing our efficiency, e-filing, but the bedrock of it is the case management system the Nigerian case management system is what we developed and are now rolling out. And uh, it's important that we have the same uh, database for all the superior courts in Nigeria, that is Supreme Court, Court of Appeal, State High Court, National Industrial Court, FCT High Court, Federal High Court. Now, we are hopefully if our adoption management works, early next year, we should have that completely rolled out. But that's an, an ambitious one. It's, I would rather say for those courts that are willing to start. Now, on my screen is what you will see as the NCMS e-filing. That is the e-filing into the Nigerian court management case uh, system case management system. This is what you see as your screen, as a legal practitioner, as a lawyer, if you want to file a case. As you can see, the dashboard on the left has some of the functionalities you would want, but particularly I'll draw attention to the drop down on the screenshot that I took, where you now see Borno State, Borno High Court, Court of Appeal, Federal High Court, National Industrial Court, Supreme Court. Yes, first instance, as you see, is the button selected. All these courts, rare it may be, but it was not a mistake. We allowed them also first instance filing because even the Supreme Court does have that once in a while. So this is it. And uh, I, even yesterday, I was uh, when I received the call, I was in the final UAT that we are doing the user, user acceptance testing. It's not easy because we're doing it for all the courts. As soon as you select on the drop down now, it takes you there. And that is when you now drill down into the specificity of the courts and their procedures. This is where you get your reports as a legal practitioner, where you see your cases in progress, where you see requests for filing a new case, because it is a request when you send it. And then when the system processes it, it sends it back to you for fee payment, after you pay the fee, it, you, send, uh, you, you send back your uh, pay, this thing is remita, it's online payment. Uh, we can bring in other, other payment solution providers later. It's not restricted to any. We're very careful not to promote any one business uh, uh, in, uh, against the, the interest of others. So it's there, but right now, most government establishments use a remita. So we're starting with remita. So you get these ones, and then you pay your fees, it goes back, and then the case is uh, moved on in the case management system now to uh, the stages that each court have. Some go to DCR, some go... The, the, so we configure each court according to its own uh, specific rules. And then it's assigned, and you get your notifications, and you come back to your dashboard, your own account, and you will see the progress or the status of your case. 
There is also in case of you want to file documents in exist, your existing case or into another existing case. Maybe you've just been briefed. Now, I must emphasize this. That is the part that will expect the cooperation and the sacrifice, the little effort it takes legal practitioners to get that legal email. Because it is with the legal email that you are already pre-authorized, pre-authenticated, pre-checked, pre-verified. Therefore, giving us the opportunity to now have this nationwide whereby, for example, you're sitting down in your chambers in Oshodi and that cattle dealer who was sued in Borno and happens to be maybe your neighbor and trusts you and wants to engage your services, you do not at all have to go to my degree to file your case. You don't need any practitioner in my degree even to stand in for you. You just log in with your Nigerian bar at nigerianbar.ng. And because we know you've been verified by the MBA, we have checked your, your name on the roll, we have finished all the verifications. You don't need to register with Borno uh, Judiciary e-filing system, no. You just go, go ahead and send in your filing request. So that is why it is important. There are so many other things I can say about the e email. Actually, it is more visionary than what we have now. A lot of things is going to be your legal identity, just the same way you flash an identity card and move in into our sites, so many functionalities. I know it's not easy to take the time to get your mail, but please, it's worth it. Otherwise, we'll just have, we'll just be replicating what we do manually. And that is one thing that we promised ourselves we will not do. What we want is to gain uh, speed, gain efficiency, gain transparency, and uh, all the benefits that come with the uh, court automation. So now that fits into the case management system, which is the engine room, which we took a lot, a lot of pain and effort to design. And it's designed particularly in such a way that courts, individual courts or state courts that I know I am a state chief judge, I know how difficult it is for us, unlike the federal courts. So we designed it in such a way that the MJC does the heavy lifting and I still maintain my interpretation of the constitution that being responsible for the recurrent expenditure of all uh, high courts uh, means it is their responsibility. Yes, they do some capital expenditure, some hardware, but even that is capital expenditure necessary for them to deliver recurrent expenditure. I know you are lawyers, but please support me on this one. So, so far so good. I have not faced much resistance. A lot of the heavy lifting has been done. I know that because I started uh, attempting court automation in my degree in Borno State. And at a certain stage, even after getting a case management system donated to me by the National Center for State Courts of the US, I couldn't just move ahead because the capital outlay was beyond what I could even ask for, lest I be sent to a psychiatric hospital by the government. So it was a good opportunity when the, uh, it came for me to do the assignment nationally. I, did, I, I, I was determined to do it in such a way that all states, all courts can use it. So we own the soft score, so, source code of the software. It's quite unlike the vendor-driven ones that are known. In fact, even in North Africa and uh, North America and any, many countries, no. This one, we own it. We can change it. We can tweak it. As I, I think I've already highlighted that fact the fact that we can do so many things and uh, configure and reconfigure at will. That is essential. Otherwise, we just couldn't see how we could efficiently roll out court automation. We store the data. Again, for site, we know data is going to be an issue, a lot, a lot of an issue as we go on, as the world moves on, whether we like it or not. So we have that integration also. The, we know our courts move up from the bottom up to the Supreme Court. So accessing uh, appeal records and all this, and they will just be taken from this database. Actually, when you move up to the Court of Appeal or the, to the Supreme Court from a state high court, it's already data they, that is in their own database that they will click on, not your own, or not, not something moving up. up. Uh, so why did we do these things? This clip, probably some of you may have watched or noticed in my presentations, I believe nothing proves our point more than this. When the five uh, chief justices of Caribbean nations came knocking on our door, 
having heard of our case management system, at that time we were just well deep into development and uh, about concluding our first iteration. They know, they've been using case management systems that were from America, yet they abandoned them. So I want you to just hear it straight, straight from the Chief Justice of Trinidad and we have in Nigeria, which we have not started really, <laughs> is better than what you have already been used to in your country. Well, there are a number of things. Um, first is that the, the systems that we would have invested in maybe 15 or 20 years ago would have been what we call off-the-shelf solutions um, from North American vendors. There are greater similarities between the Nigerian um, court processes and ours, um, arising out of the shared uh, common law heritage that, yeah. that we have already uh, referred to. Um, so, and we find that some of the functionalities that we would want out of our systems uh, are not easily available. And, and because we do not own the, the software, it is very difficult for us uh, to customize so that we can meet our own particular needs. Of course, um, a very significant element is cost because to develop uh, a case management software system from scratch is an extremely time consuming and expensive affair. So we were very, very excited indeed to find out that Nigeria had been doing a lot of work um, in developing your own indigenous system. And more importantly, um, developing a system that was based um, on an open source solution so that um, whoever had access to the system would be able to add modules, would be able to customize as required. Uh, for us, it, it represents an exciting opportunity to deepen the kind of uh, collaboration and cooperation that we have already enjoyed with our cousins in Nigeria over the Yes, so actually to continue on that uh, track, there's a lot of uh, stories to tell about uh, our effort in this one and the international traction it has gotten, uh, but that's the subject for another day. Uh, uh, suffice it to say that Trinidad and Tobago have already rolled out their own and as our uh, memo of understanding uh, stipulates, they develop something related to that or a plugin. They are to share it with us. They have already sent us a, an ODR module that when we kick off, we can use. So quickly, what does it take to have it? Now, I made a presentation to all courts, heads of courts just last week. And a lot of, some of the slides are actually from that presentation. It is titled, The Ball is Now in Your Court. And it is in the court of everybody now. As far as the JITPO committee, or my committee is concerned, we have done our job. Uh, but then, of course, we'll be there to make sure that it's adopted. So just commit and take charge if you are the head of court, or if you are an influential uh, SAN, commit and take charge. We advise state judiciaries to set up IT committees headed by judges selected purely based on their commitment to automation. And then we'll layers with them and roll it out. We have sent out the NJC through the NJC checklist, which I've been circulating to all, almost anybody who wants to have it, that this is all it takes for you to get on board. Once you check all the boxes, call the NJC. This is the checklist. Uh, and uh, as you can see, these boxes are there because we want to be precise. These are minimums. You can have more depending on the size of your judiciary or depending on your resources. You can have. Uh, well, you can't have less because some of these, uh, all these roles need the computers and all this. It's, there is no big deal. The biggest item, uh, ticket item on this one is the uh, high end uh, industrial scanner for scanning our backlogs. And even that one is uh, really not much to go about. The prices may differ because there are so many types, and we don't insist on any particular type, but from five to seven million. and. For an average judiciary, you need only two or so. And this is even a transitional thing. Once we upload and our e filing system takes off, you will need less and less of it. But I still advise that we buy because next stage is administration itself. We need to automate that too. There is a lot of, uh, I mean, this corruption talk, you will see. 
uh, has a lot to do with the way we work paper based approach. So, like this can station, just to give you an idea of how it works. So this is my scanning station in my room, one of the stations, and they're busy uh, digitizing or scanning our backlog of cases. And then which they, will, they have in fact uploaded into our system. Actually, we are in the staging environment now. We have to wait. I have to I I campaigned to have another state do it so that I don't be I will not be accused of uh, I mean, taking over the link. Well, you know, but I've already said it. It will be a failure if only my state does it. But it's late. It's on this remote hearing that I realized that that approach wouldn't work. The best approach that will work is just do it and demonstrate it and say it's doable. And I didn't do it out of my own resources, but from the agency provided platform, only with the minimum being done by me. So now, Yes, of course, I delayed uh, upgrading my systems for quite some time because I knew we were coming to this day. So it's only when now the rollout started that we decided to bring out news. We replace all our computers actually, which is something that uh, going forward we will be advising judiciaries to do because these computers, I mean, there's a lot of improvement in these systems and all these things and you really need to replace them once in a while. These are my, my boys, I'm so proud of them. My geek squad, I call them. There are so many, this is just a few of them that took the photo. So they are busy setting up the new systems. This is, this is just my court, inside the court they're setting it up. It's not for one court only, it's for the entire court. These are all uh, pieces that they are setting up. I always advise that please, please don't use pirated software, get licensed ones. A lot of the big licenses like Oracle license and all these things that are costing millions are all going to be provided by NGC, NGC is going to pay. It's the current expenditure, is their responsibility. But the ones that you use at your own small server and all this, not much really, they are, they are not much. Get, get it, uh, get the right one. Well, yes, training is part of it, but it's minimal really, if you have the good manpower. This is my, one of my guilty pleasures. I've al I was always dreamt to be a teacher and immediately I was made CJ. The one thing I wanted was a CJ, was a training room. I had another one, GRC. Yes, UNODC, thank you very much. That one was actually provided by UNOC, UNODC. So I've been using that until I wanted to upgrade it. And I've been lucky. I got a, a governor who, when I told him uh, what I've done, he came in and he said, look, well, this is not good enough. And uh, he actually was coming in to supervise. Uh, there was one incident when I, we met at the airport. I took the flight that brought him from Abuja. And I told him I was making progress. When I landed in Abuja, my CR called me, the governor was here, and he has ordered that some more things should be replaced. So not everybody is lucky, but I've been that lucky. What you see now being on display is the case management system. The training was just about to start for uh, some of the court staff. They all picked up so fast, you won't believe it. You all have them, all 36 days. We have talented young men. And, uh, and with more if we can take off the streets to come in, they will do it. They are so gifted at it. Manpower is not our problem. It's just to prioritize and give them the opportunity. This is also part of the training. And as you can see, this is the case management system that is being displayed. Aha, uh -huh. that, is, that is why you saw my geek squad, you only saw half of them. In Borno, it, it appears we are going to flip one of the old debate topics where it was being said that what a man can do, a woman can do. I think our own debate will be what a woman can do, a man can do. Because these girls that you see meek and quiet and obedient, oh my God, just give them the PC and you see the wonders they do. You could see the last one, I think, uh, the Excel sheets. They are just digitizing, the, they, they're digitized. They are populating their Excel sheets, ready for upload, checking for errors. I mean, I could almost dance to the sound of their keyboards. You have them all. You have just not given them an opportunity. Allow them to shine. We have them in all the judiciaries, all over. They are there. So. Some, well, now that's a question of independence too. I, I became realistic. Some courts may not be able to do what they want with the, this thing. If somebody somewhere has a vendor owned system, we are not going to say, no, go away, no. So long as you want to automate, we want to see how we can assist you. If for example, your governor insists on giving us a, a job of this thing to somebody of this thing, we know 
I don't want to uh, castigate any one of them. A lot of our startups are doing very well and is supporting the automation effort. So we are going to give whatever part of the infrastructure that we have. And really that is our approach, is infrastructure that we're laying. So we'll give you, you, uh, give you a part of any part that you can use. We prepare you for interface so that your system interfaces with the system that, uh, that will be used nationwide. And then your cases can move up uh, seamlessly too. And then we also give you sincere advice since we are not going to make any profit. You don't expect the vendor who owns your software to give you all the best advice. It's not in the nature of business meant to do that. This is to make profit. So we'll give you good advice. Some states already have such efforts and are using the Nigerian legal email system, which cut down. The, the vendors like that too, because it saved them from doing a lot of work that they would have needed to do in authentication, verification, and all this in allowing their portals to be used safely. So we allow them to have it, and we'll allow them to have it. But the advice is, well, if you are rich enough to throw away money, good. Otherwise, you end up, you're just buying what you already have. So 15 minutes. Thank you very much. Hello? Thank you very much, my lord. Um... Thank you for sharing. I was both enlightened and fascinated. This is a lot going on um, in the NJC, and it's very good to see um, all that's going on on that end. All right. Let's so let's yeah. say the, the element of the. Hello? I can hear you, Lordship. You said the element of. Yes, can you see the screen? Yes, the screen is down now. The down is down now. Okay. Yes, your lordship. I've been trying Thank to. Thank you very much. I think I'll have to share it again. If if you do have the time and you want me to talk about the uh, what's it called the remote hearing part of it. Okay. That just basically is just to say we're going on with it. And the last update I got, I have about uh, 119 sittings that have already taken place. And uh, that's it. I was to share the spreadsheet to show the cases that were handled remotely. And then we have a plug-in. Actually, we have an E3 license. Our uh, our e-filing is going to be hosted on the micro, uh, Microsoft Azure. And because of our license, we already had a plug-in that you could use for, for remote hearings, a complete package. But we are not restricting anybody to that. We know Zoom is very popular, so let uh, people get the hang of it on Zoom, no problem. But when they're ready, we've got something better that we can use. Thank you very much. That's very interesting. Thank you so much, my lord. There's a question here, very quick question. It says, on the court automation system, yes, is there a fail-safe process in place in case of a system crash? So that's one question. Yes, that's a very, very good question. It's one of the questions that we always ask and we ask and we ask failure, even malicious uh, attacks and all these things. We are doing all we can. First, to have a backup, active live backup that we just take on seamlessly in case some part fails, and also the cold backups too. It's not easy because even the best of ones get uh, into trouble. Just last week, we reviewed an incident that happened in the US too. Ah, incidentally, I think Maricopa County. <laughs> so. They, it, they spent, even when they recovered, they spent $1.6 million to recover. So we know how tough this is. We're doing our best. We'll continue to do our best. We can never sleep on that one. And actually, it's not something you do once and for all. You'll have to continuously check and recheck. You will we'll have even a team of hackers, our own. It's called white hat hacking, ethical hacking that will be trying to hack into our system continuously, testing our, uh, our, our staff for, for, for being uh, always ready and all this. It's, it's a difficult thing, but it's a very good question. We are, we are, we are aware of that. We, we're doing our best. Thank you so much, Your Lordship. Just, um, there's two more questions. The first one is the platform for remote hearings. How much more, but I say, how much better is it compared to Zoom? What are the advantages? Okay, very, very simple. Just go, go to YouTube and search for Microsoft Digital Justice. 
All right. In all Microsoft likelihood, digital justice. Digital justice. In all likelihood, the first one that you, the first result you see, click and play that, and then you you will see what we're talking about. Very interesting. And somebody is yes. asking how they can get more information on bonus case management and who to contact. It's not bonus case management. It's the Nigerian case management system. The NCMS. Oh, NCMS is all Nigerian courts, High Court, Supreme Court, Court of Bill, National Industrial Court. You've seen what I've shown you on the drop down list. So it's Correct. for all. So it's just when you go into the NCMS, once it's on uh, to your e filing, uh, this thing, you just select on the drop, drop down wherever you are. And then if you have the Nigerian legal mail, you're good to go. And that one is the one that says so 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 at Nigerian Bank. Dot ng. Dot ng. Yes, that, right. that, that verifies you and you have access to it. You just file straight, wherever, whichever court you want. Very interesting. Emmanuel Abraya, I can see your hand is up. So I'm going to allow Emmanuel to talk now. I guess you have a question. Just very quickly, we have just five more minutes to spare for question. Emmanuel. Emmanuel. Uh, all right, so I can't hear anything from him. Um, I'm just going to go on. So thank you so much, your Lordship, for sharing with us. Again, again for the uh, benefit, uh, for the avoidance of doubt, as a lawyer, what you need to do is get your at NigerianBar.ng, the legal mail. And then as soon as we finish the UAT, we have finished our own part uh, at the development stage. We did one with the staff of the court. Federal High Court, uh, National Industry Court, and the others. And we're also going to solicit some lawyers to do the UAT too, because there is particularly like the part, if you've seen on the dashboard, there is the chambers, the operations of your chambers too. A little bit, the, as far as our interfacing with us is concerned, change of counsel, change of uh, lawyer, leaving the one chambers to another and all this, we're mm -hmm. some, but we want you to test it too. So we'll come back to you to test it. And then hopefully if the uptake is good, early next year, we're good to go. Thank you so much, Your Lordship. This is indeed very interesting and very fascinating. Thank you very, very much. So I'm just gonna move straight on to, we have three, um, we have a judge, Honorable Justice P.A. Akero of the Edo State High Court. And we have Mr. Ade. Okay, Ine, Senior Advocate of Nigeria, and Mr. Andrew Bello, who are going to share their own practitioner based experience and opinions on the state of justice delivery. And a couple of them will speak on their views on how it affects the public and where necessary corruption. So I'll call on my Lord Justice Ahiro to speak first. Uh, we have 30 minutes for all three people, and I would appreciate if we can stay within 10 minutes each before we then go on to. Hear from our stakeholders themselves. So, my Lord Justice Ihero, would love to hear from you now. You're welcome, Your Lordship. Thank you very much, uh, Femena. I salute my Lord, the Chief Judge of Edo State. I also salute my Lord, uh, the Chief Judge of Bono State, Honorable Justice Zena. It's a pleasure hearing him. I'm so excited. I never quite knew that. Um, these developments we are already on, and it's very encouraging to us. I happen to be the chairman of the ICT of Edo State Judiciary, and so it's a very great relief to me personally that uh, the Nigerian uh, judiciary have, they have a uniform arrangement for all of us. Now, going straight to the subject that I'm supposed to discuss, um, I want to take it holistically. And taking it holistically, I think there are just two aspects. The first aspect it is with access to justice of the common man on the street. And then the second aspect is with the uh, vexed issue of corruption in the judiciary. Uh, the question of access to justice is very fundamental. I remember that the, the one of the original Bill of Rights, the Magna Carta, of 1215 in one of the opening clauses made it very clear it said to no man will we deny nor delay rights nor justice so the the aspect of access to justice is fundamental it's even enshrined in 
the Nigerian Constitution, Section 36 talks about the right to fair hearing. It talks about access to justice. Now, there are several problems associated with this uh, question of access to justice um, from the point of view of the citizenry. I will just highlight some of the problems, provide some solutions, and then before I go and speak about uh, corruption in the judiciary. The first problem is the problem of lack of awareness. The ordinary man on the street is not aware of his rights. If somebody is not even aware of his rights, he doesn't even think about enforcing those rights. And that's why the NSAS protests was actually a welcome development because it was actually to awaken the people to their rights, their rights that have been violated over the years. And uh, we can see the outcome now with the panels that have been set up by government across the state. People are now coming up, rights that have been trampled over the years, they are now ventilating them before these uh, panels. So the, the first problem is the ignorance, and I think it has to do with the literacy the level of literacy of people on the streets. Many people are illiterate, and so they don't even know when their rights are being trampled upon. And then the second aspect is that of uh, the inability to afford the cost of legal services. It's a big problem. In those days, when I, I came into the uh, profession in the 80s, the, the Legal Aid Council was very effective, and they had lawyers spread across the country offering legal um, uh, aid to indigent people and then that way people were able to activate their rights with ease but i don't know how functional the legal aid is now but um, that is part of the problem lack of access to legal aid another problem in access to justice has to do with uh, delay in the dispensation of justice just yesterday i was advising or this morning actually i was advising somebody they said they wanted to go to court over a land matter. And I told her, I said, look, an average land case will last 20 years. In the court of first instance, it may take five years. In the court of appeal, it may take another five years. At the Supreme Court, it will take 10 years. It's unfortunate, but that's the truth. And we are aware justice delayed is justice denied. So long trials, that's part of the problem. And then there's also the problem of the complexity of our legal procedures. Uh, a lot of procedures are so, are so complex that it's not easy under our current system of dispensation of justice for the ordinary man on the street to take an action without consulting a lawyer. These are some of the things. And then the problem of the courts themselves, uh, trying to use technicalities. It's unfortunate we are seeing a shift again now from substantial justice to justice by technicality. I won't want to say much because I'm a judge and I wouldn't want to say anything that will be inimical to my position. But it's unfortunate that from authorities we are seeing now, there seems to be another shift again now towards enthroning uh, justice by technicalities and sacrificing substantial justice. So these are the problems. So our system of justice is in their need of reform. And we are happy the process of reforms are ongoing. and. Uh, Court rules are being modified periodically, but there are some things that must be addressed quickly. The first one is the aspect of judicial autonomy in real terms. That's why we talk about independence of the judiciary. A situation whereby I, I listened to my Lord Justice Zana just now. Some of these things can actually be done if the funds are available. And uh, it's an unfortunate situation that Every chief judge has turned into a beggar going crap in hands. That's why my Lord Zana said that he is fortunate to have a governor that is understanding, sympathetic, and concerned and interested. Not every state is as fortunate as a Bono state. So you find that there's no autonomy, no financial autonomy, no autonomy in real terms. And so the, the judiciary is handicapped. So what we advocate is real autonomy in real terms so that the judiciary will have access to funds and they will be able to take decisions. That's the first thing that must be addressed. And then secondly, establishment of courts at grassroots levels. We are happy to say that that is already unfolding in many jurisdictions. Even in those states here, we now have uh, the small claims court was inaugurated this year. If not for the COVID, that court would have been fully functional now 
so that so that people can go to court ordinary people on the street can go to court file their actions and and prosecute their actions themselves they don't need to consult lawyers there at the court people will prepare the, the papers and it, it will be a seamless arrangement whereby there will be swift justice simple justice and there will be quick access then there's the aspect also another part of the reform which is ongoing now the adr alternative dispute resolution centers most states now in those states inclusive we now have a multi-doc court and uh, it's an opportunity because we see the, 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 the technical uh, approach of the courts uh, causing a lot of bottlenecks so we the space now should be created for alternative dispute resolution and that's the space that we have now emerging in many jurisdictions so it's a welcome development and of course as i earlier said there should also be legal aid uh, even lawyers should not shy away from legal aid. There should be uh, pro bono activities by lawyers. Uh, lawyers should be able to understand that sometimes it's not every time they, they charge fees. There might be some indigent people. They should be able to give back to such indigent members of the community uh, so that they, they, they also represent them or defend them. Uh, we're also happy to see that in some government institutions, like in the Ministry of Justice of Edo State, I'm aware there's the Office of the Public Defender I think there's also a citizen's rights center. These are avenues, platforms that are available to solve these bottlenecks. And of course, in the do state, for instance, uh, one of the things that the, my lord, the CJ, very proactive and pragmatic, they, they, are, they are now fast track courts. There are some courts that have been designated as fast track courts. So that if you want, if you want a speedy dispensation of justice, mostly for a commercial transaction of very high volume. There are some courts that have been created and those courts will help a lot in the process. And then above all, there's also the problem of manpower. It's in two areas, shortage of judges or judicial personnel, judges, magistrates, almost every jurisdiction has that problem. And then supporting staff, that is something that should be done. And again, to, it also it talks about whether we are, we are able to be autonomous enough and then another aspect is this, uh, what Justice Zana just talked about now, creating online portals to access justice, things like e-filing. At those states, we have been fortunate. We have, we have a website which is fairly functional. At least you can access things like your cost list. You can access um, rulings and judgments in the, the, in, on our website. The only problem is that we, don't, we haven't updated to this uh, e-filing um, level and uh, with what we have just heard this uh, afternoon from our lord justice zana which is a welcome development there's now going to be a uniform approach we'll go through the checklist and we'll see as much as possible how we can also get on the e-filing platform very soon uh, so all these things actually call for a synergy between the bar and the bench so and uh, luckily we have sometimes interactive sessions with the bench and with the bar and they also give some ideas on some of these things. I go straight to the issue of corruption in the judiciary. Now that is something that has negative consequences, even on the problem of access to justice, because poor people, poor people cannot even afford to access justice. And when they are now able to access justice, they now meet with the problem of corrupt uh, judicial officials. Now, on, uh, it, 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 the, the corruption in the judiciary goes beyond the judicial officers. It extends to the supporting staff. Let's take note of that. It extends to people who are involved as supporting staff, court registrars, bailiffs, even police prosecutors, even sometimes oddlies. There have been instances of a judge sitting in the court and it's only tries to take a stroll around the court premises. And all he's doing is to, to connect with people and to collect base bribes from them ostensibly to hand over to the judge and there's no so, nothing like that going on so it's 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 a hydra headed problem and uh, so it, 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 it's 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 inimical to the, the system of justice in recent times however there has been a hue and cry over some uh, uh, trial of some judicial officers I, I want to say something um it is true um professor shehu he gave his data, but the unfortunate aspect of his presentation was that the judiciary was 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 lacking. But clearly, those states now, our own state, I would have thought that the data would have assisted us to have a picture of the, the state of things. 
um, how be it, we, we need to understand that we cannot shy away from the fact that there are some bad eggs amongst us. The trial of some of the um, um, uh, judicial officials in recent times was quite uh, an eye opener. Uh, some of them, humongous sums were recovered from them, outlandish assets were seized from them, and it doesn't take anybody to understand that behind every great fortune, there must be a crime. Behind every great fortune, there's a crime. If you read the Godfather, you will see that that's the opening phrase in uh, Mario Puzo's Godfather, that behind every great fortune, there's a crime. And so when you see judicial officer with staggering wealth, they have properties in Lekki, they have properties in Maitama, they have properties in the US, they have limousines, there's a problem. And so we cannot shy away from the fact that there must be need sometimes to investigate these uh, type of people. But the problem is the procedure, the procedure adopted by government. You see, if you look at the constitution, I think the third schedule of the constitution, you will, you will discover that the disciplinary procedures for judicial officers, both judges and, the, and, and the, those in the lower courts, they are enshrined in the constitution. It's, it's within the jurisdiction of the National Judicial Council to investigate and discipline uh, 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 judge, judges of superior courts. And then it's within the jurisdiction of um, the Judicial Service Commission of the states and then that of the Fe uh, Federal Judicial Service Commission to uh, also carry out uh, disciplinary uh, proceedings against um, uh, judges of lower courts. So a situation whereby uh, government agencies, police, EFCC, they swoop on judges in the midnight and carry them and then begin to break into their houses as if they are, they are, they are, they are common criminals. They, they, they should follow due process. That is why we say they should follow due process. If they follow due process, nobody will quarrel about uh, judicial officers being uh, investigated by, 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 by uh, government agencies, but the, the proper procedure must be followed. The NJC and the JSC, they must be allowed to do their, their preliminary investigation. They must exhaust remedies at that level before uh, police begin to swoop in arbitrarily. And uh, so we, we find that uh, that is one aspect that we should be very careful about. However, um, judicial corruption can also arise from what I would call the politicization of the judiciary. There's um, an ugly trend now that uh, judicial officers are going into the political space. They mingle with politicians, they interact so much with politicians and it's not going to help the system. It will not help. And so we see politics coming to play. We can see the ugly situation now. I think it's in Cross River States. A chief judge has been cleared by the National Judicial Council and the sitting governor has refused to, 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 to swear that chief judge in as the substantive chief judge. Perhaps he wants his own crony. He wants a political judge. Perhaps he wants somebody who will be there. So that, that's a problem. However, there are suggestions. I just want to put some suggestions. Number one, there should be transparency and credibility in the appointment of judicial officers. The process should be transparent. And, and they should insist on merit. Very important. It's not a question of favoritism. The best people should be on the bench. And then there should be judicial autonomy. And of course, there should be proper remuneration of judicial officers. Also, judicial officers should, they should exercise moderation in their interaction with members of the public. A judge cannot be a celebrity or a socialite. It, it cannot, cannot be so. And then the National Judicial Council should demonstrate courage to investigate allegations of corruption. There should be no secret cows. And then judicial officers should, as much as possible, uh, they should try to keep to their oaths of office. So these are some of the things and I would just want to point out, maybe subsequently, if I'm opportune, I may be able to say more things. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, my Lord. We'll just very quickly move over to the Leonard Silk, Mr. Ade Okiaya Ine. I hope I pronounced that well, Leonard Silk. You are still muted. So I'm just going to ask to mute now. Can All right. Yes, I can hear you loud and clear. Thank, thank, thank you, you very, very much. much. 
Thank you, Femina. Uh, well, my lords, um, Elena Suk and fellow panelists, it's an honor to be part of this panel. It's an honor to be invited by the Justice Reform Project. I have followed their views in the past few months with a lot of interest. Um, I'd like to thank them very, very much. And I thank Mr. Osaroy Obame especially. Now I'm going to speak about virtual and remote hearing because that was a topic that I was told to talk about. And then maybe mention one or two things about reforms of the judicial process, uh, a bit about corruption, and um, a bit about um, the general, general problems we have with our justice delivery pro process. Now, I think that um, the larger theme of this um, roadshow is about access to justice and the delivery of justice in a transparent and efficient manner. Uh, that is where virtual and remote hearing, I think, comes in. It's a rather recent development, but uh, in my view, it's rather auspicious that uh, a pandemic should be what would introduce it to our justice delivery process and then accelerate it. Now, I don't think it's, it's, it may be novel here, but it's really not that novel in other parts of the world, in other jurisdictions, in the United Kingdom and uh, in, the, in the United States and in parts of Europe. But I think what, what, what the general process does now is that whereas in the past, it was just by video link that you did this sort of thing. Now, the virtual hearing is becoming the norm. Um, The, as I said, the difference, which is indeed very crucial, is that the remote hearing procedure has gradually become the norm. My view anyway, is that this was bound to happen. Our procedure for uh, gradually improving our civil and criminal procedure we would have gotten there with or without the pandemic. It's just that the pandemic has made it possible. I have. I have been able, I have taken part in one or two uh, virtual hearing procedures and um, the, real, the real benefit is the speed and efficiency with, with, with which things are done. But I would say that as, as much as that is an advantage, uh, there are disadvantages. And, and the real disadvantage is when you have to deal with witnesses the integrity of the process comes into question. I'll give you an example. Uh, a witness that is sitting in, in the chambers of his counsel is so relaxed. Uh, how is it possible to judge the demeanor of the witness? In our case, for instance, we had, we had gone halfway uh, before virtual hearing was introduced. And there was a stark difference with the way witnesses gave their testimony before we adopted the virtual hearing process. Mm -hmm. And afterwards, uh, the, the, the other integrity issues, uh, uh, there is a real possibility of witness tampering. How do you monitor the um, uh, certain things like, when, when you're in court, witnesses come into court and the registrar says, those witnesses that are not uh, giving evidence should go out of court and out of hearing. But with virtual hearing, where witnesses are sitting, in, sitting at home or maybe sitting in the chambers of their uh, 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 council, how do you monitor that? A, a professor, for instance, gave evidence from his, from his um, study in the United States and in, at the University of Benin at the University of Port Harcourt. And you could tell that they, they, they were so relaxed. I mean, I'm not a judge, but I think it would be difficult for a judge to really weigh the, the, the demeanor of a witness properly. That is not to say that the, the, the virtual um, hearing procedure is not, is not good. It is, it is fantastic, and I think it will work well. But how do we deal with this very important part of 
the assessment of witnesses. And then also, how do you deal with um, advocacy? You know, we, we are, we, our system, system we inherited from the common law jurisdiction is a system, is an adversarial system. And there, there are certain things that you're required to do orally in court. Um, when you do it virtually or by remote hearing, you find that the, the, the process is very conversational. Um, it's conversational. It is almost like being sometimes in a meeting of an estate association. The, that is not to say that there is no seriousness in it, but it is, it is, it is tempered. And I wonder uh, about this process going forward. Um, the advocates are extremely, extremely relaxed. Uh, and, and, and I don't think going forward that this, this, this would um, necessarily make it very, very possible for judges to um, assess things properly. Um, some, some, some lawyers are, are so relaxed that you don't know. We, we did a matter a few weeks ago, and then um, the, the lawyers were going in and out of court, now, the, uh, in and out of where they were. And the, ju the judge was very patient with them, maybe because this procedure is new, but I think there is a, there is, there is a pressing need for us to, to, to properly assess the virtual and remote hearing procedure. It is, it is very, it works very well when you're dealing with interlocutory applications because it's just counsel and the judge. But when you're dealing with trials, I, I suggest that perhaps we should, while the pandemic fades away and while it's still here, we should adopt the, 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 the directives that have been given by, by the heads of courts that social distancing and all of that should be maintained in court. We should try as much as possible when we're dealing with, when we're, we're doing trials to be in court, unless it is absolutely impossible then you deal with remote hearing. That is when you're dealing with trials. But when you're dealing with interlocutory applications, there's many applications, such as applications for amendments and all that, that can be done by, 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 by virtual hearing. Uh, I, read an, I read a very instructive article by two lawyers uh, in Lagos um, because there was a debate as to whether or not uh, the virtual hearing was um, constitutional. I think it's constitutional, but a lot depends on how on how the judges have drafted their practice direction directives, pr practice directions. Now I read two, pra two practice directions, one by the FCT and one by the Federal High Court. Access to justice, the public must have access to justice. But in those directives, it is th that particular point is missing. Of course, lawyers are allowed, judges are allowed, and their part the, the parties are allowed to come to court. But the essence, the, the constitution provides that the general public should have access to court. And there are Supreme Court decisions that have said the court should be open for the public to come in, whether or not you are part of a, a process. But those, 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 that, is, that is missing in the directives that were issued by the FCT High Court and the uh, Federal High Court. In Lagos State, I haven't seen that the, the practice directions, but it seems that the CG of Lagos State actually sent a specific directive which was pasted on their notice board that um, the public should be allowed access. I, I, I don't think that conforms with the constitutional, um, constitutional requirement. So, but, but generally going forward, I think it's something that we cannot do away with. It has come to stay. Um, how you deal with the technology, it can be epileptic. I mean, we had several uh, instances where we, the thing went on and off, off and on, but we dealt, we dealt with it. Um, I think it's a welcome, welcome um, innovation. Uh, and and it, 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 it's so far so good. So that is that with regard to virtual and remote hearing. Now with regards to reform, uh, re reform should be a constant and continuing part of the justice delivery process. 
we have law reform commissions. I am not so sure what has happened to them, but they should, they, 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 their remit is to continuously review the substantive and adjectival laws that we have, state law reform commissions and the federal law reform commission, but it seems that's dead. Uh, corruption, well, corruption is a national problem. I think it's a bit unfair to, to keep harping on about judicial you know, corruption in the judiciary. It is corruption in the judicial process. The lawyers, the, uh, the there is, is, it's a major problem. You can't, Plato said, you can't say my hand is bad, but my body is good. So how we deal with it is how we, 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 ha it's, we have to address it holistically. I agree with Justice, uh, I think Justice Akikero when he says that this is not just a, a judicial problem. It just, it's not just the judges, it's a national problem. And it's killing us. If we don't do anything about it, we, we're just not gonna move forward with, with justice delivery. Now, um, infrastructure, infrastructure is a problem. It's not enough to, to build courts, um, have computers and have all this physical infrastructure, the personnel, you must appoint the best and the brightest people to your appellate courts, to your high courts, all courts of superior, rec uh, courts of superior rec records. There's a book by Lom uh, Blom Cooper QC, and you know he analyzes the appointments of justices of the uh, House of Lords for over a hundred years, and um, the best and the brightest, all those justices. The, the first class minds. Meritocracy should be, in my view, the order, the, 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 first, the first of the metrics. Now, tribalism, nepotism, hypocrisy is worse than graft. And that is really what the problem is in our nation. With regard to the judiciary, let's not lie about it. Where do you come from? With regard to appointments of senior advocates. So let us address those issues and not apply cosmetic um, uh, principles here and there. Take it head on and not be, not be shy to call a spade a spade. Thank you very much. All right, thank you so much, Janet Silk. We're, time is fast, but I'm gonna to jump to Mr. Bailu very quickly. Mr. Andrew Bailu is the principal partner at Law House Legal Services. So we'd like to hear from you very quickly, your views, um, state of justice delivery, digitalization of courts and corruption. Thank you very much, Mr. Efemena. I don't know if you can hear me. I can hear you loud and clear. Thank you very much. Yes, good evening, my lords, Leonard Silk, and my fellow panelists. On the topic I've been given to speak on this evening, the personal experience on, as it relates to justice delivery, corruption and development. Now, I want us to just bring it down, bring it down. Don't, uh, the theories are good, but let's look at the practice on the ground here, what's happening on the ground. Now, the man on the street wants to know if he has equal access as the other man, like uh, the first uh, speaker this morning said, if Dangote is accessing the justice system today, will he get the same justice as the man my organizer outside who does not have any name or who is not known, will he get the same access to justice? I'll give you an example. Now, I filed a matter for a client. We're asking for, of course, we are the, the main suit, but we're asking for interlocutory injunction. We filed this matter, we asked for expert injunction and interlocutory injunction. We filed this matter and it took us about a week just to get a court date, a court, a court number. That's the assignment of the case. And after I haven't gotten the court, the matter assigned to a court, we're asked to wait again that the judge will be the one that will fix the date. That will be another few days before we got a date. That's like 10 days just to get a matter assigned and get a date. Within the period we're waiting, uh, Mr. Sanusi Lamido Sanusi, the uh, immediate past Emir of uh, Kanu State, Emir of Kanu filed an application to restrain the Nigerian police that period they were harassing him uh, during this deposed, uh, deposition. And within two days, he got his matter heard and 
another grant test. Within two days, my client called me from Europe and said, ah, what's happening there? You told me that my matter has not been assigned. While, meanwhile, Sanusi who filed this matter just two days ago has gotten an order. It, it begs the question, do we have equal access to justice? Can the man on the street go to court being guaranteed that he will get the same right to justice as the other man? Or is it because that man is politically exposed, he will get justice and the man on the street has no right of access to the same justice? I'll leave that one and move down to uh, the issue of justice itself. Having gotten the matter assigned, the justice that is being sought after. Now, in 2015, Sanusi Lamito Sanusi went to court when after he was detained at the airport's waiting room for four hours. He wasn't harassed, he wasn't assaulted, he wasn't brutalized. He was just kept in, a, in an airport waiting room. Maybe there's AC, even air condition in that waiting room for four hours. And he went to federal high court to challenge that his detention. And the court gave him 50 million naira award against the Department of State, Department of State Services, DSS. Now, after a few years after, or the same year, a Joe, one young boy, 15 years old, Joe in Amino in Benin City here, was arrested. Okay, he was arrested at Auchi, bundled with handcuffs, put inside a vehicle, and brought to Benin City State CID. When he got here, they handed him over to anti-court unit of SAS, anti-court unit of SAS here in Benin. Those ones kept him in their cell. And any person who is familiar with the state CID here knows that SAS cell is the, is the cell where you keep the, the worst of the worst of suspects. Suspects that, have, that, that are of the worst set, they are kept there. That was where a 15 years old boy was kept in Benin. And the painful part of that matter is that he was kept for 10 days. Within that 10 days, no single statement was taken from him, no was statement taken from anybody as complainant. So he was just kept here for 10 days without any investigation. We did all we could to get him out here. Eventually, we had to get an order from the IGP CRU in Abuja to get him out on the release. As soon as he was released, we filed an action in court. That matter went to trial. The police did not defend that matter. At the end of the day, what did we get as judgment? The court gave us 500,000 Naira as a award for 10 days of detention of a young boy, 15 years old boy in SAS cell. Meanwhile, Sanusi Lamido Sanusi got 50 million Naira for four hours of detention in an airport waiting room. I don't know if one can say this justice is the same. I don't know how it can be said to be the same. We agree that in law, two plus two do not always add up to four. But if it does not land in three, it should land in five. But when you add two and two and you get to 22 instead of four or three or five, then the question becomes, that one is not justice. People begin to look at, is that justice? Can you say two, you added two and two and you didn't get four, you didn't get three, you didn't get five, you now landed in 22. I'll come back here now. I'll take the issue of how did we get to that stage? How did we get to a stage where politicians get separate justice from what the online man on the street gets? Somebody will say, the Sanusi Lamido Sanusi example I gave, they, are, they happened outside Benin City in Lagos, so maybe that's why it happened like that. Let's bring it down to Benin City. In Benin City here, a matter was filed at about 12 noon. By 3 p.m. that day, an order has been given by a court. And by 4 p.m., that order has been pasted. The matter involving the former speaker of the Adelaide House of Assembly, Uyibe, when he suspended three members of the House of Assembly and they refused to leave the house. And he filed an action in court by 12 noon, an ex parte motion. Why that motion was to be heard, the respondents, of course, an ex parte motion, got wind of it and they sent a counsel to court. And my Lord refused to allow them hearing, uh, uh, appearance on the ground that it's an ex parte motion. That is an issue that one would look at and say, if justice were to be the same, were to be equal, how come the man on the streets filed a matter, like I told you, I filed a matter, and it took me 10 days to get a date and assignment. Now, Uyibe, speaker of Edo State then, 
filed the matter in court, and in less than three hours, it has been heard and decided. The same court, the same high court of those states, during 2017 vacation, I was in court, and a man came to court with papers, filed his papers that his house would be brought down any minute, attached evidence to show that demolition notice has been pasted on his house by a bank that wants to foreclose on him by force, according to him. And the court said, go and put them on notice. All the hue and cry by counsel that this matter has passed that stage of putting them on notice. They will bring down that house any minute. The judge insisted, go and put them on notice. And the judge took, the matter was adjourned for two days. By the third day when they came to court, the house had been brought down to rubbles. The judge only expressed regrets and nothing more. Couldn't do, there, was, there wasn't much the judge could do to the counsel or to the clients, the bank themselves. The point being made is, can we say justice is equal? If the Speaker of the Judiciary Assembly will get his order within three hours, and another man is told, even when his house is to be brought down, a two-story building at Obahi was brought down, the judge said, go and put them on notice. I will leave that one and move on to the issue raised by the NBA president yesterday on the issue of judgment execution. Now, if you have court system, justice system, that is this torturous as it is in Nigeria, takes a lot to get justice here. Having gotten that justice, you still have to go through and that torturous process of executing the judgment, of enforcing judgment. Can one say there's justice here? Can one say there's, we can access justice here? It becomes a serious issue. A man goes through the lots of getting judgment and having gotten judgment, you now begin to look at a very torturous ju uh, judgment enforcement system. I think it's time we do it with the 1945 uh, contraption uh, called the Sheriff and Civil Process Act. And look at a more really realistic approach to enforcement of judgment. We can no longer shy away from it. The Sheriff and Civil Process Act have served these days, it has outlived these days. No, it has no place in modern day jurisprudence. We should look for what we work for today. How do we ensure that judgments are enforced almost automatically, almost automatically, unless, unless we're necessary, almost automatically. And again, we cannot talk about justice delivery, development and corruption without looking at a system where an attorney general federation will come out openly and say that judgment was wrongly obtained and as such, we are considering it. But we are considering it means we will not enforce it. It doesn't, it doesn't align because a person who is watching from an, from an independent position will say what it means is the, just, the justice system in Nigeria is subject to what the politicians say. That's what it means in very clear terms, in its simplest form. I'll leave that one and move on. Now, coming down to the issue of judges' appointment. Now, judges' appointment has been a very a vexed issue that we have played on for too long. We have played on it for too long. Today, we are here, with, between yesterday and today, we've discussed a lot about how to improve on judiciary. Uh, automation of the justice system, speedy delivery of justice. Now, how many of these judges, how many of these judges we have presently fit into those criteria that we have drawn up in the last two, uh, between yesterday and now? And the ones we are appointing now, how many of them fit into that same criteria? But we are doing appointment as we speak. I believe it's also time the heads of courts begin to look at feedback mechanism, you know, create deliberate feedback mechanism where they get notice of what's happening in the courts. What are the judges doing in their courts? What are the magistrates doing in their courts? Because we can continue to wait for petitions to be written. We agree that a few persons write petition, but how many? In many cases, people go for they don't write petition. I have written petitions, I have, and I have also seen cases where I waived the, my right to petitions. There was a time I wrote a petition against the magistrates that refused to issue us with record of proceedings. And immediately, the then chief judge, immediately, within 24 hours, ordered the magistrate to give us the record of proceedings. And we got the record of proceedings. But a few, uh, last year here, we wrote for, we wrote against the magistrate who refused to give us record of proceedings, refused to give us the ruling. After three months after the ruling was delivered, it was a ruling. We couldn't get a copy because we appealed against it. We want a petition against those uh, decisions. And the CRO writing back to us on behalf of the chief judge told us that those issues were not important. That's what the CRO told us. 
haven't been so told, would we tomorrow write another petition? No. It has now become clear that it is normal. What they have, what that magistrate did in that case, it's wrong, it's okay. I'll give you another example. A colleague of mine, the same office here, did another petition against the magistrate who went completely off procedure. The magistrate took a witness half, stopped that witness, brought in another, called another witness, took that witness and went back to continue from where she stopped with the previous witness. And we challenged it. And the magistrate said, that's her court and she decided how she want to proceed. A petition was written against the magistrate to the same uh, CRO. The CRO replied on behalf of the chief judge, said, it's okay. So these are things that chief judges, head or heads of court, to look into. Feedback mechanism. Who are these magistrates that are giving us bad names? How do we, what can we do to correct some of these errors? So that before magistrates are elevated to judges and judges themselves who also participate in some of these erroneous practices, how do we correct them? How do we end these things before it gets to a disaster? Thank you very much. All right, thank you so much, Mr. Perry. This has been very interesting to listen to. Um, Justice Zana's presentation was enlightening and fascinating. Yours was annoying and infuriating. <laughs> but thank you for sharing. Uh, we don't have so thank much time. Much. I'm going to jump to our stakeholders. We have um, user and civil society groups. We have two. They're also our partner organizations here at JRP. We have Mr. Muda Yusuf. Mr. Muda Yusuf is the Director General of the Lagos Chamber of Commerce and Industry. Um, as the name implies, it deal with businesses who are, of course, the major users of um, the justice one of the pages of the justice, justice system. We also have Mr. Kola Wali Ulua Dari, who is the Deputy Director of SERAP. Many of us know SERAP. SERAP is in court literally every day, and I had to fight to bring him here. So I would um, we'll listen to Mr. Muda Yusuf first. He has 10 minutes, and then Mr. Ulua Dari next from SERAP, 10 minutes. Welcome, Mr. Muda Yusuf. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, th th thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, my lords and uh, our very distinguished uh, panelists. Uh, first, let me thank the Justice Reform Project for this opportunity. Uh, the justice uh, delivery system is one of the uh, major factors in the investment environment. And if there is any factor, uh, apart from infrastructure issues that has been affecting investment, I think it is the justice delivery system. Unfortunately, there has not been too much discussion around it. Investors struggle individually in their various corners to see how they sort themselves out. Uh, they suffer a lot of frustration and the justice delivery system has greatly affected the confidence of investors, be it domestic and more importantly, even foreign investors. It has affected the capacity of the economy to attract private capital. It has affected the quality of investors that come into this economy. Because there are some investors that thrive in areas or in regimes or in environments where the justice delivery system don't work. And they flourish, they make a lot of money. While those who are struggling to be compliant, who are ethical, has suffered greatly, suffered a lot of frustration. And unfortunately, as a result of the quality of the justice delivery system, we have inadvertently built a society or an economy that penalizes investors that are ethical, that are compliant, and that are doing the right things. There are those who are not compliant, who cut corners, are smiling to the banks. So it's a very unfortunate situation that the reward system in the Nigerian economy as far as investment is concerned, is uh, stacked against those who are doing the right things. And this happens a lot with our, with our institutions, our regulators, and all the key uh, agencies that the investors relate with. Uh, well, just as previous speakers have said, the issue of uh, the uh, uh, time frame for justice delivery is a major issue. If you are running a business and there is an issue of infraction that you need to quickly sort out, the Nigerian court system is not the place to go. Certainly because you can be there, just as has been said, you can be there for under 10 years. 
So what happens to the business between now and the next 10 years when you are in court, trying to sort out a major uh, issue of maybe uh, contractual obligations and things like that. So the, the time frame for justice delivery is, is a terrible thing. I was uh, glad and excited by what was said by the justice from the uh, states that there's a fast track channel for commercial cases and so on. I think if you can entrench something like that in the whole system, I think it will help the investment environment because we need investment to grow this economy. We need investment to, 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 to create jobs. We need the investment to reduce unemployment. We need investment to reduce poverty. And we also need the investment to even grow government revenue. Because there's a relationship between the robustness of government revenue, the growth of our GDP, and the performance of investors. That nexus, unfortunately, are not, is not being uh, properly uh, recognized. Then the cost of getting justice, which also has been mentioned earlier, uh, is a very big issue. This economy is driven largely by MSMEs. We have over 40 million of them. How many of them can successfully go through the justice system to get justice? First, from the point of view of the time it takes. Secondly, from the point of view of the cost. So they just walk away in frustration. And sometimes they resort to, to, to self-help and things like that. Then we have in this environment many laws that are static. The business and economic landscape is a very dynamic landscape. Things are changing by the day. And when you have laws and legislations that govern business that are static for 10, 20, 40 years, that's the way it affects the business environment. A good example is the Kama 2020, which has just been reviewed recently. You know, before now, we were talking of Kama 1990. That's about 30 years or so. So when you have such situations, we see businesses grappling with very archaic laws, archaic legislations, which, uh, which, which, which frustrates investment. And sometimes you have judges who also don't have technical understanding of some of the business cases that are brought before them. And because of their lack of understanding, sometimes there's a miscarriage of justice, but they just don't understand the technicalities of the business. And once the judges pronounce, that is it. Uh, so th these are some of the issues. Then the regulators. The regulators in this environment are, are, are a big problem to investors. They are the accusers, they are the judge, and they have very intimidating powers. So that it is very difficult for investors to get justice when you have an issue with the regulator. You know, they, they are practically cannot be challenged because they have all the powers and sometimes they can be very oppressive. And if you want to seek a redress, the cost of redress is so high, the time it will take is so much, the cost is so much that by the time you finish seeking the redress, the business will have gone down. So the relationship between the regulators and the regulatory environment and, the, and businesses is, is such a very, it's a worrisome one. But some analysts have described this environment that the biggest risk that you face as an investor is regulatory risk. You can invest billions of naira based on an extant regulation, extant laws. And after investing the money, a regulator can just come the following year or a few months after and change the regulation and makes no complete nonsense of your business. So who, what do you do? So we have an environment where the investors don't even have what they can call their own right as an investor. There are instances of people who borrowed money from the central bank intervention funds that runs into billions of Naira. The same CBN came with a regulation banning some of their raw materials. That was the end of those businesses. And these are things people have taken their place collateral, they have done all sorts of things. Where will they go? Some of them, many of them are suffering in frustration as I speak to you. And there are so many regulations that are just thrown at you as an investor. A few years ago, we had the issue of uh, the bank consolidation. 
Some of those banks were working very well at their own level, in their own scale. Suddenly, a governor came and said they were consolidated and he stampeded all, practically all the banks into, into margin, into all of these things. Some of them were practically not ready for it. And in the process, a lot of shareholders lost money. A lot of investors in the, in the I mean, depositors also lost money. You know, so the, the, the regulatory environment, I don't know what kind of reform you can have in the justice system, at least to give protection to investors. If you have not committed a crime, you are not, you have not run foul of any law. If there's going to be a change in regulation, it should be so measured that the shock of that change in regulation will not kill the business. The regulators have killed many businesses in this environment. And there is no so-called, no nowhere to run to, nowhere to seek redress. So that is a major issue that uh, the business environment has been, has been contending with. You talk to people who clear cargoes at the customs, they tell you very harrowing experiences. You import a cargo, you tell them that hey, this cargo is costing you $1 million. The customs will tell you, no, it's costing you five, $3 million. Even when you provide all the evidence as required, even by the customs act, and they will insist that you go and pay import duty based on the three million. So I've seen cases where import duties were sometimes hundred percent, two hundred percent increase because of the valuation issues that the customs and they will tell you that they needed revenue, that they needed to meet their target. A lot of investors face this problem. I have an investor whose import duty was tagged up by over 100%. He wrote to the customs. They said they were going to test the raw materials to be sure that the client on, on, on that sort of pressure. I hope you are hearing me. Yes, we can hear you now. Aha. Uh -huh. When you are put under such a pressure, sometimes you are forced to compromise. Sometimes you are, you, you are forced to bribe and to get out of the system because you are a businessman. What are you going to tell the, your shareholders? That you are busy fighting corruption, then the business is collapsing? You know, so these are, these are major issues that, uh, that, that, that businesses face. Then we have issues with import bans. We have issues with foreign exchange uh, exclusion. You are running a business and suddenly the raw materials that you are using or some of your inputs, the central bank say you cannot bring it in. Is that not a violation of the right of an investor? You have not committed a crime, you are a citizen and you need some critical input to run your business. And suddenly you have a circular from the central bank that you cannot bring in the raw materials as a result of some foreign and CBN policies. There should be a room within this justice reform to accommodate investors so that investors are not completely at the mercy of some of these regulators because they have killed so many businesses. They have disrupted a lot of investors. They have discouraged many investors from coming to the environment because, you know, this goes around about what happens to, to investors when, I mean, when existing investors face this kind of, this kind of challenges. So to round up, my submission is that we need to look at how we can get the justice system to support investment. Investors are facing a lot of frustration from the justice system. A lot of investors have lost money, not because they are not good entrepreneurs, but because their businesses have been disrupted and dislocated by, by policies of government. You know, without notice, without any room for you to adjust. And if you go to the court system, it's so slow that before you go through the entire gamut, your business is dead. As I'm talking to you, when we had, a, when some of our members had an issue with the lottery commission, we went to court. That was about six years ago, just to see clarification on whether if you are a business and you are doing a promo for your customers, whether that qualifies as lottery or not or whether you have to be in the core business of lottery before you can come under the ambit of the lottery commission. We have been in and out of court. This is almost the sixth year. 
the case had not been adjourned till 2021. So how can that support business? So we should see a way where the justice system can support investment. And there's so much corruption that has been overflowed in the entire chain. That's from the police to, 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 to the judiciary, even to the prisons. There's so much corruption. And there are some businesses whose business model cannot accommodate this corruption. They don't have a budget for it. Unlike some informal sector businesses or some businesses from other parts of the world who are ready to, to bribe and do things. Some of them have very high corporate governance standards that if they are caught in corruption, even their parents' company will pay for it. They face a lot of frustration in this environment. So let me stop there. Uh, I hope I've, I'm sure I've exhausted my 10 minutes. Thank you very much again for this opportunity. Thank you so much, Mr. Yusuf. It was very, very interesting listening to you. Um, we hear you say the justice system is not fit for purpose, does not protect businesses. And even when regulators take steps that crush businesses, the courts are not there to be accessed to provide the protection that they need. And this is very interesting. I mean, we have judges here, we have lawyers here listening. We need to now see for ourselves what's the inefficiencies on our part as lawyers and judges of course, for businesses, investors, and consequently, for Nigeria and for the economy, for the Nigerian business environment as a whole. Um, without too much to add, I'm going to just call on Mr. Ulua Dari, who is the Deputy Director of SARAP, to share his experience with the judiciary and the justice sector. Mr. Ulua Dari. Um, thank you very much, Bruno. Um, I'm happy to be here, and I'm delighted to be here. Um, uh, thank you, um, my lord, Vanet uh, and my colleagues on this call. Um, I, 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 I've been asked to uh, speak on uh, what we'll see as uh, a case timelines for people, for stakeholders in the judiciary. And I would think that, Sarah, with what we do, um, can, can be said to have a, a largest share of stakeholders in the, being that we do a lot of uh, public interest litigations. And that necessarily has a lot of impact on the, the, the policy of government and it affects Nigerians more than any kind of commercial or, uh, or even criminal or civil litigation. And looking at the case timelines that we have um, in the judiciary, I would say that with the plethora of, of, um, of statutes that in themselves create timelines and make dictates for um, expeditious areas, vis-a-vis uh, -vis the rule of the rules of court and what we see in practice, it's, that's a huge gap. And so we have the Electoral Act, which I think is the most adhered to, and so the, the cases are finished within that time. But what about cases that have far much, far much reaching policy implications, like the Freedom of Commission Act, which provides clearly that it used to be had and determined expeditiously. Uh, we, we have tons of cases on Freedom of Commission Act, that, which is yet to be decided. And looking at what we do, it, it, it would appear that, and, and this is my experience with public investigation, that the judges seem to be unaware of, of the case management as to timelines, looking at the importance of the questions that have been brought before them. I, I can give instances on and on. We, we have tried a case this year on the FOIL Act by the federal government. It's yet to, it's yet to be assigned. And that's going into months. We have filed a case against the National Assembly to determine some of the actions of the National Assembly. Uh, for instance, buying a car worth 400 million for its members, 37 million naira to renovate the National Assembly. These are timely questions that require urgent intervention. Even one way or the other, those cases are yet to be determined. And so it goes on and on. And then I use room without that timeline where the users of courts, whether being lawyers or litigants, can say with exactitude when they will get some form of justice, even if it's against them, it creates a problem for everyone. And that cannot be to deter the interest of even the judiciary and the citizens themselves. And now to speak about the court infrastructure. Insofar as what we lawyers do is technical in nature and is unknown uh, to those who are non-lawyers, to laymen, it creates another set of problems where the infrastructure is not even friendly uh, to, the, to court users, even to lawyers themselves. So the question is, how many courtrooms in Nigeria have access, even with, with pre-COVID-19, uh, in real-time court hearings, have uh, court recorders? I think Lagos State has the best in that, and not all of them are functional uh, as before the COVID-19. Uh, so, and then that brings up another issue which I've always uh, found very troubling for me, about court records. 
I've always found that this thing we say in court about that the court pleases, it's really true and it's literal to me. When you apply for record proceedings, you find that the, court, the judge has written what he, wants, he or she wants to write. And then the court record is really as the court pleases. Because the court record, being written in long term, leaves discretion for whoever is writing to write what he or she likes. But with the use of infrastructure that records and the stenographer, it becomes easy to have a literal interpretation of what is said, and then the, the turnover of getting your appeal written and the records in time is something else. Uh, it, it improves that uh, a lot too. And then I'll speak uh, very quickly on administrative case management. And that is from what we've seen with, uh, with the e-filing and what I've seen demonstrated there before now speaks mostly about the registry part. What about the the administrative um, arrangement of court sittings, which I believe are the rules of courts. Uh, the judges have a lot of control, but we have seen less done in that regard. What about times of sittings? Those are part of that administrative uh, powers that the court has. Can the court schedule a sitting to say, okay, I'm going to take this kind of cases, case management per day and write rulings at this particular time, and take arguments at this particular time, and structure them in a way that is not only convenient for litigants and stakeholders, but also convenient for the court itself in everything scheduled by time. And that is what I'm, what about the discipline of our staff? Who disciplines the registrar um, that um, I've been complained about? Is it the judge or is it referred to the chief registrar? And what control does the judge have over that? And we've seen instances where um, uh, lawyers have been complained to the judge in writing about uh, the acts of the registrar and nothing has been done about that. And then I'd like to speak about the attitude of the court, uh, which I think it may not be uh, in the best interest of the stakeholder, in, stakeholders. Again, this is within the context of not lawyers, but laymen who do, who do not really understand what we are doing in court. And so it becomes harder for even the average lawyer to explain to his client what is the stare decisis, what is that case law on it at the stand. Because I've often asked myself the question, who makes the rules? We have uh, individual judges even deciding what is precedent and what is going to be followed, even when there are clear lines of, uh, of decisions from the Supreme Court without any attempt at distinguishing the cases. And that itself creates another kind of problem. And for what we do at Sarah, public interest litigation, one would think that there should be clear lines of petitions that establishes what is. And that when there are novel areas where the questions of law are gone before the court, that should be determined speedily. In the absence of technicality, that the lines become clear, that at any time when the line is that law, the line between human rights breach and what is to be is crossed, the courts are, 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 are frank and quick uh, to make that argument. But we have seen less of that. And that's why we've seen a lot of our cases. And, and this is personal to what we do at Sarah. So we have people take us on to ask us, uh, Sarah, we filed so much cases. How much, are, how many have you won? What has happened to the cases? And we have to give updates periodically with most cases dragging so slow that we can never even have a clear position on what is the position of law. This is very critical issues of social economic rights of Nigerians. Uh, and lastly, I'd like to touch on what I would like to call ethical training for, because in, in, in the administration of justice, it's basically about lawyers. Uh, my laws are lawyers before they were members of the bar before they went to the bench. And so when we talk about ethics more often than not, what we have seen uh, from the bench is the kind of talking down to the bar, forgetting that as part of the bar, if there, are, if there is no ethics on the bar, naturally it, 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 it flows up that way too. And I think that is something that should be attended to, not necessarily at the level of the law school, but possibly as part of the it, it, I wouldn't know how to provide the best solution for that. But it's something that should be looked at deliberately and strategically to, in, to in, uh, increase the quality, the ethical quality of the bar. And naturally, that will transfer uh, uh, to the bench. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you so much, Mr. Aluadari. Thank you so, so much. In fact, you left us with a couple of minutes to spare. Um, would I say now, fortunately, unfortunately, we don't have any questions. So um, the way it's looking, it looks like we may just proceed to close. But then I would just like to, um, there's, there was somebody who mentioned something about manpower. Honorable Justice Ahiha mentioned the need for more judges. But then a question comes to mind. Do we necessarily need more judges or do judges need more support staff? Is it thought I've myself? The way we have lawyers and we have lawyers who have 
junior lawyers in chambers, would it help the judges if they have younger, perhaps practitioners, support them with the work they do? Maybe a team of three, five people. So all the judges have to do is judge while the lawyers and younger people, you know, assist in um, the, the process. So for, in essence, for manpower, do we necessarily need more judges who would cost more for the states? Or would it help to have a properly staffed chambers with younger lawyers who aspire to be judges, who are competent, you know, are capable of assisting my lords? Yes. Uh, can I respond? Yes, you can, your lordship. Thank you very much. Now, now, we need more judges. The reason is quite obvious. Yeah, I think what you are talking about, you are talking about legal assistance. Now, with the age we are now is a digital age. And with the right digital tools, I made bold to say, with the right digital tools, with something as simple as a law pavilion, you don't need any lawyer to do legal research for you. All the legal research materials have been automated now on platforms. And a judge who knows what he's doing, I say it with all sense of responsibility, a judge who knows what he's doing now in this age should be able to access the law on these platforms without consulting any human being. You see, because we find this ourselves in a situation whereby I, I was in a conference once and a, a legal assistant took the microphone and what she said that day shocked all of us and embarrassed some of us. Mm -hmm. mm. That's the judgment for the judge. And that all that the judge needs to do is to, is to sign the, 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 the judgment. So where we are now, we need people who are competent. And I, I think competency now is not about knowing law because the concept of literacy has been redefined. It's not the ability to read and write anymore. There's now what we call computer literacy. So a person who, is, who aspires to judicial office should be computer literate enough to work on platforms where you can access the law, where you can use digital tools. So what we need are people, human beings as judges. We don't need it so much. If you look at the corporate world now, you don't find people having secretaries and having a retinue of staff around them anymore. You have people and then they are manning systems and they are working on so that's that's my position. That's my take. It's my right. personal to me. Thank you so much. I guess just Susanna wants to speak. And before just Susanna speaks, I just like to point out that um, in courts, even in the US, we have clerks for judges. We have clerking as a regular practice. So although I agree that technology assists, we must to some degree understand that. I think, in my view, that clerking and assistance would help. But just Susanna wants to say something. So I'd like to hear. Um, yes, I, 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 I agree 100% with this lordship that honestly, legal assistance, as, were, as was understood, is now overtaken by technology. There's a lot, and with AI, with artificial intelligence coming, it's even getting to be much better. But the point I, I think has already been made it's not only just the quantity, but the quality of Thank staff. You that that is true. I mean, I've had all the presenters and I agree with all of them, honestly, on most of the points made. Uh, let's call a spade a spade because if we're going to reform justice, I think we have to tell ourselves the truth. So the quality, not only of court staff, but also the quality of judges we have. I don't want to start washing linens. So that is a fact. It's not the quantity, it's the quality. A point was made that I want to also talk about by the last speaker about ethics. Really, really, there is the need for ethics training. Incidentally, my Lord, very good. Fortunately, my Lord is there. Please go to the UNODC site, international. I, I happen to be involved in developing a judicial ethics training tool for judges. Take that test. That one, if you go through, it's actually a training. After the training, you take a test and you get a certificate. I've been campaigning at all the fora at the NGI for us to do so. It's sad, let me be frank. I, uh, I, I happen to be a member of the uh, UN Judicial Integrity, Global Judicial Integrity Network. Nowadays, I'm a little bit ashamed even when I see the level of participation from Nigeria. 
a lot was expected of us. I took part in training, tra uh, developing this training module. But when it, it became time for them to see, and it, it's seen, nobody sees what you do. You can save it, go back, come. It's only when you pass that you can even declare that I have passed and show you a certificate. But even the attempt, very few, smaller, smaller nations come in and participate. So there is, and it is also for lawyers too, and quite rightly observed, is the lawyers that become judges. Mm -hmm. I am really tinkering even with the idea of saying, okay, before I start uh, the next process for uh, appointment of judges, I want to see a certificate that you have passed that judicial uh, uh, tra ethics training tool. I made it for that of the automation. Uh, 10 years ago, I, I mean, let's be frank about it. Some of the things don't just happen on themselves. Some of these, uh, my geek squad that you saw, 10 years ago, but precisely when we implemented it, it was 2012. Since 2012, each employment we, we do in the judiciary, we have a mind that every court should have an IT support. Not much, not big, rudimentary, at least basic computer training to support our case management system because that's what we were, uh, we were trying to develop. So the quality in short, the quality both in terms of the ethics, in terms of skill. So yes, the uh, applications are there to use, but if you bring in judges who are still scared of computers, where are you? How can, you, how can they use it? So let's, let's call a spare a spare. It's mostly about the quality. We That's need it. to up our game. Thank you, Lordship. Uh, I'm just going to move to Mr. Ade Okeya in Leonard yes. Silk. I was yes. going to ask you the ethics question because I think it's yes. very important. Um, we say at JRP that um, being silk is a rank of leadership in competence yes. and character. Yes. And I just want to hear your views on judicial ethics. Just to echo what my Lord Justizana said, the JRP is actually aware of this ethics training and it's something we intend to move around courts and we hope to push for judges to, um, to take this and we hope to, to work with this. So let's see, we'd like to hear your views on what we can do about ethics at the bar. We see lawyers many times bend over for clients. So how do we, how do we restore the pride of the Nigerian bar and bench? What is your take? Well, uh, I think my Lord Justice Zana has said it all. Uh, you see, what, what I think has happened in our country is that over a period of time, maybe 25 to 30 years, our values have, have, um, have been warped. They have changed. They are not good values. We must understand that you know, there is an objective type of values in, 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 in the world. And we've moved that aside. And we have what I would call subjective values of materialism, which has attacked our culture and attacked our entire fabric uh, uh, the entire fabric of our nation. And this is reflected in, in, in all professions. I mean, we are being hard on ourselves. Uh, we're talking about judges, we're talking about lawyers. Um, in the UK, you see, what, what, what helps the bar and the bench is a system, a system that is entrenched uh, where you go to the inns of court. Mr. Agobame is very, very aware of this and I, I suspect Mrs. Uh, uh, Mrs. Adekoy as well. The ends of court, you learn the ethics of the profession and it stays with you for life. It is the, it, it's, it's a convention. You, the, 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 sanctions, it, the sanctions are not necessarily written anywhere, but it becomes part and parcel of your culture. What do we do about that in Nigeria? You know, um, maybe you can't get it from the law school because the law school is just a year. So there has to be some sort of institutional way of checking it. I mean, just, my Lord Justice Zana made a very powerful point now when he said, if I'm gonna appoint judges, I want you to show me a certificate, a certificate of competence, a certificate of, of, um, of you know, ethical, ethical uh, competence. The bar as well, there must be a continuing way, a continuing way of, of judging the ethics of lawyers. And, and we don't have, we don't have a, 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 a proper one now. You have the bar, the legal practitioners, uh, privileges committee, and then the disciplinary committee. But that is also sometimes politicized. We have to be frank. Um, growing a society is about obligations. We are, not, we are not honoring obligations, obligations of values of culture. So that, 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 that's my take. Thank you so much, Leonard Silk. Um, we have no further questions. 
I will now call on the Chairman Governing Board Just from Project, Mrs. Funke Adepa Smith Pit of Nigeria, to give her closing remarks and make any comments she intends. Um, thank you very much, uh, Nathamina, for moderating this session. Um, I thank my lords who have graciously given up their time this afternoon. I thank the other panelists who have made it clear what the justice system encompasses and the effect on the justice system where it is not performing to standard. I listened especially to Mr. Muda Yusuf speaking about uh, fast track courts. We have fast track courts in Lagos, they're not working. I, have, I actually suspect they've actually been abandoned. I also listened to Sarah speaking of the importance of challenging the system. It's not a question of how many cases one wins, as he correctly said. It's a question of constantly keeping the judicial system aware of their obligations to the society. In this context, I, I listened to both sides of the argument in respect of whether law clerks or legal assistants can support the judiciary and if taken on board can be a factor in terms of judicial sector reform. I'm one of those who supports the use by judges of legal assistants. I think the problem has come from the use to which judicial assistants are put. I think that if judicial assistants actually spend their time on law pavilion, bringing out the cases and conducting a pricey of the cases that council have cited in their respective addresses and doing a comparative analysis. I think the time of my learned judges is better spent in thinking rather than being on the internet and doing the Google and the research themselves. I think that we would have a greater development of the law when precedent is not merely followed, but precedent is distinguished and the law is developed because the law should be a living thing. One of my personal frustrations is reading a judgment that refers to an authority and then you go to that authority, to the page that is cited, and discover that in fact, this, the second case is a cut and paste of what the first case merely said. And so there has been no development in the law over the years. I think, as I said, perhaps the use of judicial assistance has not been properly, they're not there to write the judgments. And I'm aware of some judicial assistants who have actually complained that some judges use them to write the judgments. They say, okay, go and read this, go and read that, and give me a draft. And that's not what they're supposed to do. They're supposed to actually pluck out those authorities that counsel on both sides have cited. And tell my lords, at, at this page, that is not exactly what the judgment said. I'm one of those who say, if you want a judge to read an authority, please cite it and quote from, the, from that portion. And I've had instances where I've gone back to court to say, my Lord, the authority that my learned friend has cited, he did not cite correctly. The missing words in between actually changed the meaning. And so I think we need our judges to spend their time in thinking of the issues that are brought before them. A matter went to the court, to the Supreme Court in Pennsylvania yesterday. The decision came out yesterday because of the elections. And that is the judicial system that the GRP would like to see in Nigeria. A system that works and that works for everybody, not just for the emirs of this world, but for the business people who are being harassed by regulatory oversight and excessive changes in regulatory legislation. So with that, I'd just like to say thank you very much to all the panelists. Not only have you contributed robustly to the discussion, you have given the GRP more food for thought. We are actually engaging with UNODC in terms of ethics for lawyers, because they have a course which we're trying to push for the law school, that students in the law school should take that online ethics course as part of their law school training. I think that ethics is important. So GRP is, is working with UNODC 
we have reached out to the director general of the law school and we are hoping that eventually it will go it will it, it will be taken on board the director general has said that yes he's interested in having the students take that course but we are yet to see it actually going out to the students that you must take this course as part of your training so so that that's one aspect of it we look forward to a full implementation of the jis some of us in lagos now that our courts have been burnt down are looking at it as the silver lining that maybe this is the opportunity that we have to embrace this electronic digital platform and that money being spent on rebuilding the court infrastructure is money that should be spent with the emphasis on a digital and an electronic platform rather than just building the structures. Structures are important, but we don't need to house the case files inside those structures. We need to have those case files inside the cloud. Once again, I thank everybody for your various contributions. On behalf of the GRP, it has given us a lot to think about. And I can assure you that we will take on board everything that has been said from the bench, from the bar, and from civil society. And as this roadshow moves on to the next location, we will have more to engage with, and we will keep you all informed of where the progress is. We look forward to your continued support as we try to ensure that our justice sector in Nigeria is fit for purpose. Thank you very, very much. Thank you so much, Mr. Adekoya. Now we're going to bring this to a close. We'll just thank our partners, the UNODC, Integrity Organization Limited. Uh, we thank SERP for coming on board. We thank Lagos Chamber of Commerce and Industry for coming on board. All our panelists and everybody who participated. This is the end. We see you next time. Another state, another geopolitical zone. Goodbye. Till then. Thank you. <laughs>